Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that may not be suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. On Friday, March 12, 1999, Dr. David Tipton of Decatur, Alabama, came home to an eerily quiet house. He called for his wife Karen, but didn't get an answer. He noticed the cover panel to the alarm system was lying on a kitchen counter. He later said he didn't think anything of it because they had been having issues and expected a technician soon. He kept walking through the house and hung up his coat in the foyer. There, he saw one drop of blood at the end of a staircase, and then he saw that more blood was smeared on the floor. He still wasn't really thinking the worst yet. He thought maybe somebody had just gotten hurt. He kept calling for Karen as he walked up the stairs, and then he found her. She was nude, battered, and covered in blood, having been stabbed 28 times and her throat cut. He later said it was hard to even tell that it was his own wife. She had been dragged to the part of the hall where David found her, making it impossible to see her body from outside, even though they had large windows with a view to the second-story landing. He immediately called 911 to report that his wife had been murdered, and he didn't know where his children were. The call to 911 came in at 4.27 p.m., and at that time of day, his children would have been home for more than an hour already. He had no way of knowing that Karen had never gotten the chance to go pick up her daughters, that she was dead already. And for him, the nightmare was only beginning. For the next ten years, David would endure three trials, loss of all privacy, and become the victim of a vicious small-town rumor mill, fueled by the suspect's defense team and irresponsibly reported by local newspapers. Welcome to Episode 11. Decatur Justice, the murder of Karen Tipton. Decatur, Alabama is home to about 56,000 people and is located on the banks of Wheeler Lake along the Tennessee River. Like many other port towns in the South, Decatur's early success in the 19th century was due to its proximity to the river. Boating traffic and railroad routes quickly made it a boom town. However, in the 20th century, it became overshadowed by Huntsville during the space race, as Huntsville is home to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. However, the port of Decatur has kept the small town fairly prosperous. Decatur has grown to be the busiest river port on the Tennessee River. The port sees large amounts of barge traffic from up and down the river, which has led to 12 Fortune 500 companies opening plants in the small city. Tourism is also a large part of the city's economy, with hundreds of thousands of people from all over the country and the world coming to attend some of the most premier Southern festivals, including the Alabama Jubilee, the largest hot air balloon festival in the South. Like many small towns, there is a cultural divide, and this one literally has the proverbial train tracks separating the East from the West. David and Karen Tipton were clearly on the right side of the tracks. Both were 39 years old, and they'd been happily married for almost 10 years. She was a former second-grade teacher, now a stay-at-home mother to daughters Catherine and Caroline, aged 3 and 7, and Dr. David Tipton was a successful psychiatrist with a practice in nearby Huntsville. They had a beautiful home, a mansion by many standards, at 2330 Chapel Hill Road in Decatur. It was 5,000 square feet and is worth about $400,000 today. The Tiptons were popular in their community. They had a tight circle of friends, and both came from very close and loving families. By all accounts, they were living the American dream. On that Friday afternoon of March 12th, David came home early because they had theater tickets to see The Sound of Music. After the shock of finding his wife's body, he immediately called the police. He consented to searches of his person, the crime scene, as well as the rest of the home, and agreed to go in for formal questioning. He also had an alibi, having come straight from work in Huntsville and his partner at their psychiatric practice, as well as their office manager, backed up his alibi and what time he left for home that day. Obviously, as usual, 
The husband was the first suspect. But detectives cleared David almost immediately with his alibi and later with forensic testing. To David's relief, they also quickly found the Tipton girls, still at school, waiting for their mother to come and get them. Family friends took the girls while David walked the scene with the detectives, pointing out that Karen's purse, their video camera, and some jewelry were missing, though the large diamond engagement ring was still on her bloody hand. And then he went with the detectives to the police station, where he submitted to questioning until being released at 3.30 a.m. The next morning, he had to tell his two little girls, Carolyn and Catherine, that their mother was dead. And yet, he doesn't describe this day or the day that he found Karen as the worst moment of his life. He said that happened about a week after her murder, when his three-year-old daughter asked, When is Mommy coming back from heaven? When someone dies unexpectedly, it's difficult to explain to children, especially those as young as Catherine. Many people will tell small children that the person has gone to heaven and cannot come back. But often children can't understand that concept, and Catherine was no different. To her, it was like mommy went out of town to a place called heaven. David wasn't just dealing with his own shock and grief. He was also trying to comfort two little girls who could barely grasp that their mother was gone. It took the medical examiner nine pages to describe all of the wounds on Karen's body. She had blunt force trauma all over her head and face, as well as to her arms and legs. Karen had definitely fought hard. Both of her eyes were blackened, her lips were swollen, and there was no doubt she was raped, though semen was not found. She had three large incision wounds to the front and back of her neck, her right shoulder, right index finger, her left arm, her lower abdomen, her left hand, and the labia minora, or her outer genitals. The cut on her labia is why the phrase sexual torture is brought up so often in this case, though I don't plan to use it repeatedly. In all, she had suffered 28 stab wounds, in addition to the severe beating, rape, and cuts to her throat and genitals. The Tipton's bed was covered in her blood. There was a bloody towel found near the bed with a pubic hair found in it, and another hair was found in the bed. The hallway where her body was found was also extremely bloody. Detectives Mike Petty and Ken Collier had surmised that the attack had begun downstairs in the living room where Karen's shirt was found, and then she was taken to the bedroom. They believe she broke free during the rape, which would explain why there wasn't semen found, and ran to the hall trying to escape. Her killer caught her there, finishing the job. After searching the house, the police were unable to find anything other than the two hairs. No fingerprints or DNA from anyone else was found, and without a suspect, they had no one with which to test the hairs against. So the case stalled for more than a month before Decatur police received a call from a man named Herman Moore, also known as Sparky. Turns out his nephew, Daniel Wade Moore, had confessed to him that he had been in the Tipton home when Karen was murdered. Police quickly went to a motel where Daniel Moore was living and brought the 24-year-old in for questioning. He signed a waiver of his rights, agreeing to talk to the detectives. He initially denied any involvement with the crime or even that he knew the victim, Karen Tipton. Though Daniel Wade Moore denied any involvement in Karen's murder, he had made several mistakes already, and Detectives Petty and Collier had done their homework. First off, they knew of Moore's long rap sheet. He was addicted to crack cocaine and had been busted many times for drugs and petty theft. And he had also been popped for passing some 33 bad checks all to support a $150 a day crack habit. Later, at trial, two different pawn shop owners testified that Moore pawned a video camera and other jewelry just days after the murder. But even more damning, detectives found out that Daniel Wade Moore was previously employed with Advance Electronics and Alarm Company, and he also had no verifiable alibi for the afternoon of March 12th. 
Daniel wasn't just an employee of the alarm company. He was one of the technicians who installed the security system at the Tipton home. He did know Karen Tipton, and he had knowledge of not only the alarm system, but the layout of the house, as well as her and David's schedules. He would have known exactly when Karen would be home alone, and he would know exactly how to disarm the security system. When confronted with this, the detectives say he became visibly shaken, nervously shuffling his feet under the table. At this point, Petty and Collier left the room to observe more from a monitor in an adjacent room. As soon as they left, Daniel Moore pulled out a pen knife and began stabbing himself in the chest. He was taken by ambulance to Decatur General Hospital, where he stayed for three days, recovering from some serious cuts. At this point, I'm going to take a break for a brief word from our sponsors. As soon as Daniel Moore was released from the hospital, he was brought back in for questioning, and this time he admitted to telling his uncle Sparky that he had been at the crime scene. He had said he was there to rob the home, and was upstairs when another accomplice, whom he conveniently could not name, attacked Karen Tipton. Now that he was talking to the police, he denied all of this. He said he made up the story to his uncle and grandfather to get them off of his back about his drug use and many arrests. He maintains this same story to this day, and his same reasoning that he would rather admit to being at a murder scene than discuss his drug abuse and criminal offenses with his family. I'm sorry, but that has to be one of the most ridiculous lies I have ever heard. Would you rather admit involvement in a brutal rape and murder rather than discuss your petty crimes with your family? He uses the same excuse for his suicide attempt, that he stabbed himself not because he was afraid of being tried for murder, but because he was ashamed of himself for disappointing his family. Well, if that is true, why did he wait until he was in police custody, being questioned about Karen's murder to attempt suicide? Regardless, while Moore was in the hospital, the police got a search warrant for his motel room, where they found drugs and paraphernalia and were able to secure a warrant for his arrest. That, along with the forgery charges for the check hiding, was enough to hold him. Then finally, after Karen's autopsy report was finally turned in, a huge point of contention for David Tipton because it took them more than five months to get it in, the police got a warrant for Daniel Wade Moore's DNA in October of 1999. It took over a year for the DNA testing to come back, but when it did, they arrested Moore in November of 2000 on capital murder charges. He was re-indicted in May of 2002 for five counts of capital murder, for murdering Karen Tipton during the course of committing a rape, a sexual abuse, a kidnapping, a robbery, and a burglary. Representing the state were Assistant DA William Dill and Chief Prosecutor Dan Valeska, with Valeska taking the lead. Representing Daniel Wade Moore were Attorneys Sherman Powell and Catherine Hallbrooks. The court would be presided over by Judge Glenn Thompson. The main evidence against Daniel Moore was the DNA match to the hair samples found at the scene, his confession to his uncle, his installation of the Tipton home security system, and therefore his knowledge of both the house and the victim. And finally, he had no alibi. This should have been a slam dunk case. In Sherman Powell's opening statement, he tried valiantly to imply that David Tipton was responsible for the murder of his own wife. He used testimony from a paving company that had paved the Tipton driveway the day before the murder and were in fact next door paving the neighbor's drive the day of the murder. One of the men, Hoke Bonner, would later testify to having seen David Tipton an hour before he said he arrived at the home. This is contrary to David Tipton's two alibi witnesses, his partner and his office manager. But Powell's opening statement wasn't as egregious as the one his co-counsel would make. Catherine Hallbrook's opening statement basically stated that Karen Tipton's murder was a crime of passion. She insisted that Karen Tipton knew her murderer, 
had let him in the house and for whatever reason was angry with her that day. She then proceeded to go into a series of rumors and outright lies attempting to back up this ridiculous claim. She told of her intention to call a witness that would testify to Karen going through a drastic change in appearance. She'd recently gotten a haircut. This witness would also testify to her knowledge of a, quote, daily mail visitor that came in a pale-colored pickup truck. Hallbergs also alluded to several marital affairs by both of the Tiptons. She also hinted around about things that would be found on the Tipton home computer and said that a friend had asked Karen and David if they would like to swap partners. This last bit is unfortunately true. It's one of those gross things that happened to so many women. Karen was instant messaging with David's friend, Mikey Zell, about an upcoming party when he jokingly said they should do a wife swap. Karen laughed it off at the time, but she immediately told David about the conversation, although she wasn't particularly disturbed by it. David was a bit upset about his friend making this suggestion, even if he was just joking, and also admitted later, on camera, for Dateline, that he was disappointed in his wife, that she would even carry on such an inappropriate exchange, even if it was just in jest. I believe him, and I think it's entirely believable that David's friend could have had a drink or two and gotten flirtatious over instant messaging. He certainly wouldn't be the first man in history to hit on another man's wife. I think it speaks to his character as well as David's that they never denied this exchange. They met it head-on in court. They didn't, however, address it publicly. In fact, David Tipton never made one public statement throughout the three trials of David Wade Moore. Unlike the defense counsel, he followed court rules and remained silent, believing in the importance of obeying these rules. In doing so, he submitted himself to a torturous trial by public opinion, led by the Decatur Daily newspaper and Daniel Wade Moore's defense team. Powell and Halbrooks were determined to paint the Tiptons as having multiple affairs, with Karen's supposed relationship with Mikey Zell being David Tipton's motive for killing her. Mikey Zell also never publicly commented on the case, nor did another man they accused of having an affair with Karen Tipton. A prominent attorney in Decatur that I won't even bother to name because there has never been a real shred of evidence to prove the man even knew the Tiptons, much less that he had had an affair with Karen Tipton. To go through every aspect of the first trial would be incredibly time-consuming and pointless, as I've already told you there will be two more trials, but I will summarize the main points. The state sought to show that Daniel Wade Moore had motive, means, and opportunity to commit this brutal crime. His expensive crack habit had already landed him in jail for theft. He had no alibi for the day and time of the murder. And most importantly, he not only had installed the Tipton alarm system, but had met the beautiful Karen Tipton in her home on the day of installation. Defense attorney Sherman Powell, in his closing argument, called the sexual charges repugnant and claimed that it was only a ploy by prosecutors to invoke the rape shield law, protecting the private life and reputation of a rape victim. This tactic is disgusting and generally would not work. But Judge Glenn Thompson refused to enforce the rape shield law and after all testimony urged the prosecution to drop rape charges to make charging the jury simpler and the jury found Daniel Moore not guilty of rape or attempted rape, although they did find him guilty of murder, robbery, burglary, sexual abuse, and kidnapping. And it's not as though the prosecution merely had circumstantial evidence. They had physical evidence. Daniel Moore left two of his hairs in the crime scene. They were compared microscopically and were found to be consistent with Daniel Wade Moore. One was found in a washcloth covered in Karen's blood in the bed. That hair, thought to be Moore's pubic hair, had been forcibly removed and had a skin tag attached. A genomic DNA study of that skin tag showed two persons' DNA present in a mixture. So the hair was washed and a mitochondrial DNA study was done on it, in effect, to separate the two DNA profiles in the mixture. 
the mitochondrial DNA of this hair was matched to Daniel Wademore with a certainty of 99.8%. The mitochondrial DNA of the second hair, without skin tag attached, also matched Daniel Wademore with a certainty of 99.8%. The genomic DNA mixture was found to contain Karen Tipton's DNA. Her blood had been washed off of Moore's hair with a certainty level of 2 billion to 1. And the same mixture matched Daniel Moore's genomic DNA contribution with a certainty level of 7.5 million to 1. Cheryl Marsh, a reporter for the Decatur Daily News, in her coverage of the trial, never mentioned these large numbers. Instead, her headline was that three different laboratories had three different results on the hair, implying that there was some conflict in the data between the three independent laboratories. It's true that initially the hairs were tested in different labs. The defense is entitled to the right to independent testing. They also have the right to have their own DNA testing done and an expert testify. They did neither of these things. But it didn't stop Cheryl Marsh from irresponsibly reporting on the supposed three labs, screaming in daily headlines that the hairs did not match Daniel Wade Moore. Okay, there are still plenty of people who insist that hair analysis is a junk science. But even if you feel that way, it is impossible to deny the power of the DNA testing. The defense never even tried to. What they tried to do was put the victim on trial as well as her husband, and Judge Glenn Campbell allowed them to do so, contravening Alabama's rape shield law, which bans the defense from bringing the victim's prior sexual history out in open court unless they can tie that history directly to the defendant, which they obviously could not. But Campbell allowed it to be alluded to multiple times during the trial anyway. After the jury's verdict was read, Judge Campbell said he was immediately dismayed. He was also interviewed for Dateline sometime later, a rarity that is generally frowned upon for sitting judges. And he said he did not believe the state had proven their case. But he said he had to follow the letter of the law, and as the jury found more guilty on all of the capital charges, except for rape, he sentenced him to death. A couple of months later, as Daniel Wade Moore sat on Alabama's death row, Judge Campbell and defense attorneys Powell and Halbrooks became aware of evidence that the prosecution had withheld during trial. The state failed to disclose allegedly exculpatory statements made by two witnesses that would support the defense's case, and also, more egregiously, the prosecution failed to disclose 245 pages of materials that had been forwarded to the FBI by the Decatur police. Based on these findings, Judge Campbell overturned the jury's verdict and ordered a new trial. He then ordered Daniel Moore released by the state, even though there was an appeal pending. He also illegally barred David Tipton and other family members to be present at the hearing to release Daniel Moore, even though they had every right to be there. Though this was reported rather gleefully in the Decatur Daily and also in the Huntsville Times, it did not go over well at all with the Alabama State Appellate Court. The state filed a petition for a writ of mandamus in this court, attacking the circuit court's ruling granting Moore a new trial. Quote, a majority of this court requested that the respondent answer the allegations contained in the state's petition. They gave the judge 21 days to respond, and he filed his answer with the court just eight minutes before the deadline. Here is Judge Thompson's response. Quote, because of the violations of the discovery order, the undersigned seriously considered dismissing the case with prejudice. However, the court feels that justice would not be served to do so, that the victim is entitled to her day in court and the defendant is entitled to a fair trial. A dismissal of the case would serve no purpose other than to warn the prosecution that the courts in this state will not tolerate violations of its discovery orders. Whether or not the violations were intentional or simply the result of neglect, the court cannot say. The bottom line is that they did in fact occur and that the only possible way to correct these violations requires that this case be tried again at the earliest possible date. 
So basically, Judge Campbell felt that the evidence withheld was tantamount to a dismissal of charges, but decided to grant a second trial anyway. And it gets worse. The appellate court denied the judge's petition, and so did the Alabama Supreme Court. So then, of course, Daniel Moore's attorneys filed motions to dismiss based on Brady violations and the Double Jeopardy Clause. And despite Judge Campbell's earlier statement to the appellate and superior courts that the victim and the defendant deserved their day in court, he astonishingly supported this motion for dismissal and ruled that Daniel Wade Moore be set free immediately. So he basically did a complete 180 on his own damn ruling. Luckily, the Criminal Court of Appeals did not agree with his ruling. In an exhaustive written decision, the court ruled by majority that though evidence was suppressed in the first trial, it was not serious enough to support an entire dismissal of all charges. They also pointed out that because Moore's attorneys moved immediately for a new trial, Daniel Moore became ineligible to invoke the Double Jeopardy Clause because that is only in effect if the defendant had been found not guilty and then was put on trial a second time. He was found guilty and was granted a new trial because of the discovery issue. Let's briefly go back over the evidence that the prosecution did not disclose. They had two eyewitnesses to refute David Tipton's version of events and support Daniel Moore's, and also that supposed 255-page report from the FBI. But I'm going to talk about the two witnesses first. Sarah Joyce Holden, a friend of Karen Tipton's, would testify at the second trial that she spoke with police after Karen's murder. She said Karen had complained to her on the Sunday before her death that she was not getting any sleep because of her security system malfunctioning. Allegedly, Karen told her that she took the system out of the wall or that she ripped it out of the wall. Miss Holden said she could not specifically remember whether she told police what Karen had told her about her security system, but that she felt sure that she did. Well, this is contrary to what David had already told the police. He said the alarm panel was still on the wall when he left for work that morning, and he noticed it on the counter only after he returned. Quote, It was unusual, but it was not so weird, given the fact that our alarm system was not working and we were expecting it to be fixed. The second witness, Pamela Brown Smith, the Tipton's next-door neighbor, had called Decatur Police after she found out that they were placing the time of death between 1 and 2.30 p.m. Time of death can be notoriously hard to pin down, and the investigators came to this conclusion because Karen never picked up her daughters from school that day. Pamela Smith claims that she saw Karen Tipton at her mailbox at 3.30 p.m. when Miss Smith was returning home from picking up her own daughter from school. Now, I'm not saying she's a liar, but I do believe the detective's timeline is correct. If Miss Smith saw Karen at her mailbox at 3.30, then why had she not picked up her daughters? I believe Pamela Smith was mistaken as to when she saw Karen Tipton, if she did indeed see her. David Tipton writes extensively about Smith on his website and points out many inconsistencies that the police also found. First of all, Smith claims that she called the Decatur police but could not remember who she spoke with and that they never asked her to come in and make a statement. It wasn't until after the first trial, when Moore was convicted, that she came forward. She contacted Moore's attorneys to give them her story, not the police. And as for the supposed 245-page FBI report, the state's prosecutor, Don Valeska, testified that he became aware of the FBI's involvement in the case after Moore was reindicted in May of 2002. He said that sometime in August or September of 2002, he discovered that two FBI agents had been in Decatur concerning the case. Valeska said that about one week before Moore's trial, an FBI agent phoned him and informed him that he had a file on the case. This FBI agent faxed a five-page document to Valeska. Also in July of 2003, Valeska received the 245 pages of documents from the FBI. The information consisted mainly of questionnaires that were completed by the victim's family members and friends. 
These documents contained questions related to knowledge of Karen and her habits and lifestyle. Specifically, the questionnaires asked for information concerning the length of the respondent's relationship with Karen, how they met, knowledge of her family, how she dressed, her personal grooming, what she did in her spare time, her likes and dislikes, her lifestyle, her number and type of friends, any enemies or persons she disliked, her reputation at home and at work, her sexual orientation, her medical and mental health history, any noticeable personal habits, her mode of transportation and how it was maintained, and any other significant events that had occurred before her murder. Basically, all of these questions were about Karen Tipton, and the answers, if used in court, would violate the rape shield law. Of course, the judge and defense attorneys had already trampled all over Karen Tipton's rights by openly insinuating in court and in the press that she had had multiple affairs and was indeed carrying on an affair with a local prominent attorney. Lead prosecutor Don Valeska stated that several weeks before Daniel Moore's trial, investigator Michael Petty of the Decatur Police Department told him that he had forwarded materials to the FBI. It was Valeska's understanding that Decatur Police had contacted the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, known as VICAP, to request a profile of Karen Tipton's killer. Petty told him that he had asked the FBI for a profile, but that they had never completed one. He further testified before the appellate court that he never intended to withhold exculpatory information because he did not consider these materials to be exculpatory. Investigator Petty testified that in order to compile a profile of the killer, the FBI sent forms to be completed by Karen's family members and friends. He said that he distributed the forms, collected them, and did forward them to an FBI agent. He testified several times that he did not keep any copies of the documents that were sent to the FBI. Detective Petty said, quote, It was information that they wanted for a profile. It wasn't anything we used in regards to the investigation of the homicide. The forms that they have, these VICAP forms, they ask for opinions and speculations and that sort of stuff. And that's not something we can use in regards to the investigation. If it's not factual, then you know you can't incorporate it as part of your report. Basically, these profiles are intended to be used as investigatory tools, not actual evidence. And that is why it's misleading to call the documents the prosecution had a report from the FBI. They were merely answered questionnaires from dozens of friends, family, and acquaintances of the Tiptons. And the FBI never actually formulated a profile, something that former FBI agent Julie Stapp testified to in the third trial. She said that the FBI was, quote, an investigative arm lending assistance to the Decatur police. She also pointed out that they did not even have jurisdiction to formally investigate. She insisted that the FBI's role was to have developed a profile and that it never happened. What the 245 pages amounted to were actually a victimology report. And during the third trial, though this report was never actually entered into evidence, Moore's defense attorneys kept alluding to the information found in these pages. Let me repeat that. This supposedly explosive 245-page report from the FBI was never entered into evidence. In fact, you cannot access that supposed document to this day. Agent Stapp testified that it contained sensitive, private information that had nothing to do with Karen's murder, but if entered into evidence, would have been a breach of Alabama's rape shield law. This did not stop defense attorneys Halls, Brooks, and Powell from getting some of the details on record, nor did it stop them from leaking the information to the Decatur Daily newspaper. They alluded to multiple affairs by Karen and even, quote, a Daily Mail visitor to the home. They were never able to actually prove this visitor's existence, but Halls, Brooks, in particular, repeated the phrase Daily Mail Visitor enough that it became one of the biggest sound bites in the trials. Yes, all of these things look bad, 
Any time a prosecutor hides evidence, it's extremely damning to the state's case. And why he chose to hide the two women from testifying is beyond me. Frankly, I believe Pamela Brown Smith was just mistaken, either by the time or the day. To me, it's fairly simple. Karen Tipton failed to pick up her daughters from school. She didn't call the school or otherwise make different arrangements. By 3.30, she would have already been late. After all, that's when Pamela was returning from picking up her own daughter. As for Sarah Holden's testimony about Karen supposedly disconnecting the alarm system herself, well, so what if she did? The facts of the case are that the alarm wire was cut. We don't know for sure who did that. Karen could have reconnected it after talking to Sarah. She could have simply been venting or exaggerating or threatening to, quote, rip it out of the wall. There is no evidence to prove it either way. What we can prove is that Daniel Wade Moore not only worked for the alarm company, he installed the system at the Tipton home. His boss testified that he would know which wire to cut that would not only disarm the system, but specifically cut off the panic button. David himself was not concerned when he saw the front panel of the alarm system on the counter. He pointed out to police that they were having issues with the system malfunctioning, and he assumed his wife had called the alarm company to come out and look at it. Daniel Wade Moore had been in the Tipton home. He knew the layout. He knew the alarm system. More importantly, he knew her. Investigators have said repeatedly that there were no signs of forced entry. It's entirely possible that Karen opened the door to Daniel Moore because she recognized him. Perhaps he came over under the guise of repairing the alarm system, especially if Karen had been complaining to her friend about the system acting up. Don't you think she would have let in the technician who installed it to take a look? She probably let Daniel Moore in and followed him as he went to look at the control panel where he then cut the wires. The kitchen was close to the living room where the police determined the attack started. There was a bloody footprint in the foyer, which would make it seem that Karen tried to run out the front door but was stopped. She was then dragged upstairs to the master bedroom, where she was raped and assaulted on her own bed. She then managed to break free and make another run for the front door. Daniel caught her in the hallway, continued stabbing her, finally cutting her throat. I firmly believe that this is exactly what happened. To me, the jury in the second trial had obviously been swayed by publicity. Several of them agreed to be interviewed for a 48-hour segment with Erin Moriarty. She asked them, quote, Indicator, how do people view Daniel Moore? They answered with a resounding, unified, not guilty. When she asked who they thought did kill Karen Tipton, one female juror responded, Well, some say Dr. Tipton, some say a jealous wife, some say a boyfriend. I hear everything. Now, obviously, this interview was after the second trial, and she is referring to rumors she could have heard after her time on the jury. But I kind of think that's doubtful. The impression that she and the group as a whole gave for the interview was obviously slanted towards the defense. The second trial ended in a stalemate between jurors, resulting in a mistrial. So you can just imagine what happened in the third trial. There had been nine years of rumors, innuendo, outright lies, and slander. Decatur had lapped up the scandal with disgusting relish. David said, quote, I'm the pot and porno guy. I'm the multiple affairs. I'm the, you know, wild, crazy, sex party, sex swap, wife swapper, king of sex swapping club. All of these things have been said about me. In that first statement, he is referring to a small amount of marijuana that was found in his home after Karen's murder. Remember, he immediately consented to his home being searched and was not the least bit concerned with any damning evidence the police might find against him. And he was right. The police did not feel it was necessary to bring a misdemeanor possession charge against a grieving husband. The part about pornography? Well, that is the computer evidence that Hallbrooks alluded to in her original opening statement. In the web cookies on their home computer, some pornographic websites were found. 
After the first trial, the hard drive was again searched, and it was found that someone had deleted some of the files. Probably some pornographic files. Lots of people download porn on their computers. It does not in any way make them criminals, unless, of course, it's child pornography. And it certainly does not mean that they somehow engaged in risky behavior that resulted in their murder. It is disgusting and prejudicial for this sort of evidence to be allowed into court. Again, it's like Karen and David Tipton were on trial, not Daniel Wade Moore. So the jury in the third trial, after having been contaminated for years by the media and shown prejudicial and irrelevant so-called evidence by the defense, found Daniel Wade Moore not guilty. To say this is a miscarriage of justice is just not strong enough. This travesty of three trials further ruined the lives of David Tipton and his daughters. They received death threats from people who steadfastly support Daniel Moore. They could not escape the ongoing rumors and publicity, and what's more, Catherine and Caroline were terrified that their mother's killer would find them. David Tipton wound up moving his girls out of state to start their lives over. And for the record, Daniel Wade Moore has not exactly been a model citizen after he gained his freedom. Indeed, he has been arrested several times for burglary, drugs, and most recently in 2012 for a DUI with a hit and run. You would think that a man who managed to escape capital punishment would at least try and turn his life around. But no, Daniel Wade Moore continues to behave just like the scum he is. And David Tipton, of all that are associated with this case, completely understands what happened in these trials and in Decatur. If you're interested, he has an extensive website which breaks down every aspect of all three trials and also every sleazy thing that the judge, defense attorneys, and so-called witnesses have done. There were some witnesses that I didn't even bother going into because they were not in the least bit credible to the defense's case. The website is called KarenTiptonMurder.com, and I encourage you to take a look if you are interested to read more. He has trial transcripts and many documents related to the case, but he also has raw, blog-like testimonials about what this case has done to him and his daughters. It is an extremely sad glimpse into the aftermath of a murder. But I also have to say that Dr. Tipton is a very smart man. He is able to break down legal documents in a very clear, if sometimes biased, manner. So no, I obviously did not and could not base all of my research on Dr. Tipton's website. But I did review all of the trial transcripts and media coverage and came to the same conclusions that Dr. Tipton did. There was a corrupt and biased judge, a prosecutor who bent the rules, and disgusting tactics used by the defense attorneys to put Karen Tipton on trial, both in court and in the media, making it impossible to secure a conviction against Daniel Wade Moore. This case is a sad study in what not to do on both sides of the courtroom. As David Tipton said, quote, It has a life of its own. The lies have continued. It will always continue. It wouldn't matter if more confessed. It wouldn't matter. There will be thousands of people in North Alabama that will believe I killed Karen and that she was having an affair and deserved it. That shadow is there and will always be there. He's right. And because of that, I believe a guilty man went free and that there will never be justice for Karen Tipton. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Special thanks to listener Natasha for suggesting this case. And I apologize for my voice quality. Winter will just not give me a break this year. If you like the show, please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I know iTunes doesn't make it easy for you, but it is still the best way for others to find Southern Fried, so I really appreciate your help. I am also on Stitcher and many other apps like Auto Radio, Overcast, and Pocket Casts. If you're interested in supporting the show, please go to patreon.com forward slash Southern Fried True Crime. 
I have different rewards for each level of donation. You can also support the show by visiting my shop at whatamaneuver.net. You can order t-shirts, tanks, hoodies, and even onesies for babies. They do great work with quality materials, and I'm really excited about this partnership. Again, that is whatamaneuver.net, and search for Southern Fried True Crime. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Southern Fried True Crime if you would like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing the Tipton case further, come check out my discussion group. It's linked to my main Facebook page, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, y'all take care.